Great. The end users in your organization build apps. Whether you love it or hate it, they do it every day. They do it in tools like Excel or in Access or in web platforms that are recommended by their friends. And they do it because it makes business sense. These are the folks in the organization who understand how the business works. And they understand that as the business changes, their apps can adapt to the changing business. But they need help. They need help to do it right. They need help to develop apps in a managed, safe environment so that data is properly handled. Too often, apps are poorly designed from the very beginning. And some percentage of those apps end up becoming mission critical to the organization. And when poorly designed apps become mission critical, they become enormous problems for IT to manage. Wouldn't it be great if there was a program that helped people build apps the right way from the beginning? I'm Steve Greenberg. Kevin and I are here today to introduce you to Access Services 2013. And we couldn't be more excited to do it. We're going to show you how the people in your organization can use Access Services to build apps in just about 60 seconds. Now, Access Services has a mission. And our mission is to allow end users to quickly create business value with server-based apps. Why quickly create? Why is this whole talk called apps in 60 seconds rather than, say, apps in 60 minutes? The reason is because for end users to develop applications, they need to see the value of the platform really, really quickly. These aren't people who are willing to put in time ahead of time to architect the right solution up front. If they were those kinds of people, they wouldn't be called end users. They'd be called developers. So by definition, these are folks who need to see value in apps quickly. Now, server-based, why is that so important? Access for a long time has been known for creating desktop databases. And the reality is that although desktop databases are absolutely still supported, they in many ways don't meet people's expectations anymore. They don't meet people's expectations for collaboration. People expect to be able to get access to their data on any machine, their own machine, somebody else's machine, an airport kiosk, or their phone or slate. It's just no longer acceptable to say you can only access this application if you have a particular version of Access running on a particular version of Windows connected up to a network file share. It just doesn't work for the modern environment. And also, desktop databases don't meet people's expectations for security or reliability. It's just too much of a liability for data to be on a file where it can be sent around in mail or put onto a thumb drive and accessed by the wrong people. So apps need to be server-based. Let me illustrate quickly the value of end-user applications by showing you a little bit about one of our preview customers. McKinstry's a company uh, in Seattle. They do green building. And we work with them during the preview to build an application. And we've got a quick video to introduce, introduce you to that application. While we worked to put the finishing touches on Access 2013, we contacted some businesses to try it out and see how easy it is to create an app that meets their particular needs. During this effort, we contacted Caroline Traub from McKinstry. At McKinstry, we do building energy audits, looking for energy savings for our customers. We use a lot of different audit tools, loggers, temperature sensors. Right now, they're difficult to locate and track. Without a checkout check-in system, tools get left on site at individual workstations or hidden in the tool room. After doing a web search and talking with colleagues, we couldn't find a simple solution that immediately met our region's needs. We worked with Caroline and using Access, created a simple tool tracker app for McKinstry. This is just the type of app we hope users can create on their own, or else they can go to the SharePoint store, download a free Access app, and tailor it to their own needs. A main requirement for this app was that it was easy to use. We want users to come in, check out their tools, and be on their way. 
The dashboard page has buttons for the most common tasks. We've integrated a barcode scanner to quickly filter to the tool being checked out. Once the tool is checked out, it appears in the checked out list. Bulk checkout can be used to check out many tools at once. Simply scan them in and click the checkout button. Here, a job name can be added. Again, now that they are checked out, the tools appear in the checked out tools list. Simple. The web app solution was affordable, easy, and ready to implement. Check it out at office.com slash preview. Choose the option for small business to get started. So McKinstry had this problem. Their tools were being lost, and they needed to keep track of them. And it's exactly the type of problem that's faced by small businesses and enterprises every day. But it's not the kind of problem that justifies the investment to build a full .NET solution to solve it. And even if they did build a .NET solution, because this is such an ad hoc process, that solution would quickly get out of date. So it was a great fit for access services. Let me quickly talk about today's agenda. So we're going to kick things off with a demo that's going to fulfill the basic promise of this talk that, we, uh, that you, you came in to see. Uh, Kevin's going to build an app in 60 seconds. Then we're going to quickly touch on the architecture behind Access Services 2013. It's brand new. It's different from Access Services 2010. And we're really excited to tell you about it. Then we're going to talk about what it means to design an application well. And we're going to focus on two aspects of well-designed applications. The first is a well-designed data model. And the second is a well-designed user experience. And we're going to talk about how Access Services apps create both of those right out of the box. And we're going to finish the talk with a discussion of how Access Services apps fit into the larger SharePoint app model. That's something that you're probably hearing quite a bit about this week, and so we want to make sure that connection's made. But without further ado, Here's Kevin's app in 60 seconds. OK. So as Steve mentioned, one of our big promises for this release is that you can be up and running with a fully functional web app in about 60 seconds. I'm going to show you guys how that looks. Now, to get started, I'm going to need a volunteer from the audience. Now, we're talking about building apps fast here, right? So for my volunteer, I need someone specifically that's interested in speed, things that go fast. Is there anyone here that fits that? How about you, right there? It, it, the one in the hat. <laughs> Why don't you come on up? How are you doing? I'm Kevin. Let's figure out what type of an app you need to build. So I'm guessing, based on the way that you're dressed, you're a little bit of a racing enthusiast, aren't you? OK. You're wearing a helmet, so you race motorcycles. Not motorcycle. You know what? I've seen you on TV. You race cars, don't you? OK, I bet you, I bet you race a lot of cars. How about we build an app for you to track all the cars that you race? OK, we have an app idea. I'm going to execute on that. So we're looking at the Access client right now. And this is where I'm going to get started to create my app. I'll simply click Custom Web App. I need to give my app a name. We decided we're going to track race cars, so I'll call it race cars. And ahead of time, I created a SharePoint site for myself on Office 365. So I'm going to use that as my URL. And I click Create. As soon as I click Create, Access goes out, talks to my SharePoint site, and says, create a blank SharePoint app. The other thing that happens is it goes to SQL Server, because I'm running on Office 365, SQL Server is running on Windows Azure, and it tells SQL Server to create a blank database. The next thing that it does is it hooks up that SharePoint app to your SQL Server, so your content's in SharePoint and the data's in SQL. And with that, we're ready to start building up the app. We're looking at the at table screen, and I'm going to address this question right here. It says, what would you like to track? We've already decided that we're going to track cars. So I'll do a search for cars. 
First result I get back, this is a list of table templates to help me get up and running quickly with tables. First result that I get back is exactly what I need, so I'm going to click that. As soon as I click cars, Access creates all the tables, relationships, and the views that I need to work with that data. So with that, my app is done. I mean, I've been talking through it, but that was about 60 seconds worth of work. Why don't we take a look at what this looks like running in the browser? So I'm going to go to the ribbon and click Launch App. And this navigates me directly to the app in whatever my default browser is. It could be Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, whatever. Navigates me directly to the app. And this is what an app in 60 seconds looks like. I'm going to go ahead and start showing you how I use it a little bit. I can add a new uh, make of car here. I'll enter Toyota. I can enter the specific car. I'll create a 2012 Toyota Camry and save that. So this is an HTML and JavaScript standards uh, web app backed by a SQL Server database created in about 60 seconds. Now, before I hand it back to Steve, I just want to pull back the... Thank you. Before I hand it back to Steve, I'm just going to pull back the curtain a little bit. I mentioned multiple times, this is running on SQL Server, right? Here's the same version of the app that I created earlier, only this time I have a bunch of data. Now, I'm going to switch programs quickly here. I have SQL Server Management Studio running. I've actually connected SQL Server Management Studio to the SQL backend of my app. Here's the list of all the tables in the app. In the tables in SQL Server, the names match exactly what I have in my app. I wrote a simple query here that just says, update the car Eldorado to be test. From SQL Server Management Studio, I'll run that query. Now let's switch back to my app and see what happened. Here's the Eldorado. I'll switch away and back to the view to get the latest data, and it's been updated. And that was done outside of Access because I was talking directly to the SQL Server. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Steve. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I want to say uh, this app in 60 seconds vision was something that we started about 18 months ago or so, and it was just sort of a phrase that we threw around. But I have to say, it's really thrilling to be able to get here and actually show it to you uh, in person. It's one of these places where the, 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 the tagline actually lives up to the message. So I think Kevin deserves another round of applause for that. There's, you know, in the SharePoint, in the overall SharePoint division, we're totally excited to introduce the new uh, 2013 app model to you today, and there's a bunch of folks who've done a bunch of great work here, but I don't think you're going to see another session at this conference where anybody builds an application as quickly as Kevin just did. So let me just quickly re rehash what Kevin did. He opened up the Access Rich client, but instead of creating a traditional desktop database, Kevin chose to create a new app, a new web app. He did that, and we provisioned a site on SharePoint Online for him, and we also uh, cr created a SQL database on Windows Azure. Then Kevin filled in the question, what do you want to track with cars? And we answered back with a schema pre-canned already for, his, uh, for him to build the app. Um, we have about 150 of those schemas already in place on office.com, and we're adding more every month. So as I said, this app is hosted on SharePoint Online and backed by, uh, by SQL databases on Windows Azure. Let me quickly dive into that. There's a unique SQL database created for every single Access app that a user creates on Office 365. It's in a Microsoft-managed Windows Azure account. That database is just like any other SQL Azure database. You can connect to it with ODBC, like Kevin showed you. And this is huge. Last release, we built Access Services 2010 on SharePoint lists. And in many ways, they were really great but they weren't a great place to build a relational application. We found ourselves really wanting the full power of SQL. And so that's why we dedicated ourselves this release to moving over to SQL databases on Windows Azure. We use a web browser to interact with the application, to read data and edit data. And if we want to redesign the schema or the forms or views on an application, for that we use the Access Rich Client. Now, Throughout this presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about SharePoint Online, and I'm going to be talking to you about Windows Azure. But I want you to know that all of this works just as well with your on-prem installations of SharePoint. SharePoint on-prem 
can talk to your own SQL Server on-prem, and you can use access services in that configuration. You can, uh, we have a whole talk tomorrow that Lois is giving about how to configure that and set it up. So let me quickly talk about the three pillars of Access's value proposition. First, quickly create. You're hearing a lot about speed here. As long as you have a SharePoint site, all you need to do is name the application, and we, Access Services, take care of all the heavy lifting for you. We set up the, sh the app, and we create the SQL database, and populate it with your schema. And I want you to compare that to the time it would take an end user in your organization to sign up for their own Windows Azure account, set up a SQL database on it, and create a .NET application that talks to that SQL database. We're really talking about an order of magnitude difference here. Second, our second pillar, experience easily. We're going to show you much more about this in the rest of the presentation, but the gist is that Access Services applications are really beautiful out of the box and have a very simple user experience, designed so that users can get in, get their work done, and get out. And finally, control. Now, control speaks to the underlying architecture that we're talking about. It's just a SQL database, and you have all the power and control that you'd expect in a SQL database. So with this high-level plan in place, let's dive into the details of what these apps look like. And so first, my question is, is it important for an application to have a good data model? And to answer that, I might suggest that you do a web search for spreadsheet horror stories. You'll find that there's a whole cottage industry of people collecting examples of times when companies had horrible things happen to them because of data stored in spreadsheets. Just a couple of examples that I found particularly interesting. Um, in, the, in August 2010, the Federal Reserve released its consumer credit statement, and the numbers were $4 billion off. And somebody went, th went into the spreadsheet and looked through it and figured out that it was a copy-paste error. Somebody had pasted the 2009 values into 2010, pure, purely by accident. In the London Olympics this summer, 20,000 tickets were sold to a synchronized swimming event, which is great, except that the venue only holds 10,000 people. And this was just due, due to a keystroke error. It could have been prevented with validation. And finally, Hungary's central services directorate was fined $100,000 when they sent out a request for proposals because it was misleading. And users filled in data in the spreadsheet rather than using the formulas. It's a mistake that I'm sure everybody in this room has made. The reality is every day we see databases, we see, sorry, we see spreadsheets that have inconsistent data. The spreadsheet with columns uh, with people that track their activities, and the columns are called activity one, activity two, and activity three, which makes it absolutely impossible to query and find out all the people who share a common activity of interest. The spreadsheet with a list of due dates, except that you scroll three quarters of the way down the list and see that one of the due dates isn't set to a date at all, it's set to the string tomorrow. The common case of duplicate data in the list or the situation in which a particularly enthusiastic end user thinks they understand normalization and normalizes a database to the extent that it's just not human readable anymore. So we think it's important to have a great data model. We think it's important to do it right. We think that setting up a data model means that you're creating an application which, if it does become mission critical, will be easy for IT to manage. And the point here isn't to poke fun at your average business users or say that they're inept. It's just that this is complicated stuff, and these are folks who shouldn't be thinking about data normalization. They should be thinking about their knowledge of the business. So we think that the attributes of a well-designed data model are, it's relational. It's normalized to the right degree so that data integrity is prioritized and preserved. We think it needs to be validated so that data is consistently typed and made sure that it's within a valid range. And we need to make sure that data is that data, not duplicated. So now, Kevin's going to dive into that Cars app that we just built and show you how Access Services apps fulfill all those tenants. OK, thank you, Steve. So let's keep working on this Race Cars app to show how Access helps you create great table schemas. I'm going to switch back to the Access Designer. Now, one of the reasons that I was able to get up and running so quickly was that I took advantage of what we call table templates. Now, table templates are prepackaged table schemas that includes the tables, their fields, relationships, and the views to work with that data. 
And these table templates are hosted online on office.com. And they represent what we found to be the most commonly tracked objects uh, in Access. Now, as time goes on, we can continue to add more based on feedback and what we find people are looking for. We can tweak existing tape templates, again, based on feedback, so that we're sure to always give you almost exactly what you need. Now, when I did a search for cars, notice I got a whole list of results here. It wasn't just cars. It was stuff related to cars, like agents. They could sell car insurance. Trips happened in cars. Car maintenance log. If you want a car maintenance log, your maintenance applies to the car, as the name implies. So I'm going to play with this one. I'll select car maintenance log, and it's going to create those tables in my app. Now, there's one important point that I want to make here. Cars maintenance, log, cars maintenance log requires cars. Cars already existed in my app. Access recognized this, and it doesn't wipe out my existing cars table where we lose all the data. It doesn't create a second cars table and call it cars one or something like that. It's actually going to reuse the existing cars table in my app and hook up the relationships with that. Let me show you a little bit of what that looks like. I'll select the maintenance log that I just created. Then I choose the settings charm. And I can go edit table. This opens up that table in the table designer. And here we can see all the fields that make up this table. Here's what I was talking about with car. Car was created as a lookup. So it's looking at the existing cars table. If I select modify lookups, we can see some more details of that. So here I've specified I want the lookup field to get the values from another table or query. The table we want to look at is cars, and we're going to display year produced here. Now this is important. We found that a lot of users, when they're new to databases or new to access specifically, they don't understand the power of relationships and lookups. They're going to continue creating, like what Steve mentioned, those spreadsheets where you have multiple columns tracking the same data. However, if you give them a pre-created example, something that they can already use, and they can look at the existing relationships and lookups, they understand it pretty quickly, and they see the value of that. So the idea is you'll start using the table templates, and where appropriate, you'll use that. By using them, you're going to learn about good table schemas. And as you create your own tables, you're going to apply that knowledge and continue create to create the tables right. So I'm going to close this out. And the other thing I want to point out here, when I added maintenance log and it just reused cars, the idea here is as you're building an app, you'll continue selecting table templates, and you'll just kind of start building up the app together with these pieces. And of course, you're free to create your own tables if that's what you're interested in. Now, we've found using table templates, you're going to get most of the way to a complete solution. But in almost all cases, there's going to be just minor tweaks that you need to make just so you can customize this app for your specific needs. A great example of this is, say you're using a products table, and the field that we give you is product number. But maybe in your business, you use product ID, or item ID, or item number, or any number of things. It's really easy to go in and tweak what we've given you so that you can modify the app that uses the language that your end users understand. Let's take a look at what that looks like. This time, I'm going to modify the cars table. So I'll select that, open the settings, and once again, choose edit table. Let's figure out what we need to do to modify this table. Now, we've already decided you race race cars, right? Now, I'd imagine there's some pretty expensive cars in that collection. OK. Well, what's the point of having expensive cars if you can't show off how much they cost? My idea is I'm going to add a field to your table to track the price of these cars. I think he likes it. So I'll scroll down here. And I'm going to go to the blank line in the table designer. And I'm going to create a new field called price. By default, Access has decided this is going to be a short text. It's actually not what I want here. So I'll expand the drop down. And instead, I'll change it to currency. Now we can go ahead and modify the properties of this field even further. And for example, I've noticed that my volunteer has a British accent. So I'm going to modify the currency symbol to be pounds. And there's other modifications that I can make. I could add a validation rule 
So we won't let users enter data less than zero dollars, for example. I can add data macros. For anyone here that's familiar with SQL triggers, it's kind of the same idea. So after you insert, update, or delete a record, you can actually specify your own logic to respond to those events. I'm not going to go into detail on that right now in the interest of time, but we do have sessions later in the week that's going to dive into that. So I've modified the table as needed, and I'll go ahead and save my changes. As soon as I save, access goes out, talks to the SQL server, and says modify the table schema based on what we've provided here. Now the other thing that's happened is we've recognized that because you've added a new field to your table, you're probably going to want a place where you can view, edit, and add new records using that field. So we actually modified the existing views for you and added controls for you to be able to do that. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Close out the designer. And once again, I'm going to launch the app in the browser to see the latest changes. Now notice this price field was added. That wasn't there before. So now I can go in here, and I could add whatever the price is. And it's formatted exactly as I specified with pounds. Now think of what this scenario would look like in previous versions of Access. You would add a field to your table. You'd have to think about what are all the forms that use this table. You're going to have to open up all those forms in the designer. You're going to have to drag the control onto the designer. And you're going to have to hook up the data binding. Now, I'm not saying that's hard to do, and it's not complicated, but it's busy work that you shouldn't have to deal with, because you're always going to need it. So we take care of it for you. So that's what it looks like to add a field to an existing table. But let's say we want to take this a step further, and we want to continue to add more tables to my app. I'm going to switch back to the designer, and let's look at the list of tables here. At the bottom, there's a button, Add New Table. This takes me back to the Add Table screen, which we've seen already. Now let's figure out what kind of table we need. So we're working with our expensive race cars. I know your race cars are fast. How would you like if we could do something to track the performance of those cars? OK, it's pretty easy going. So I'll go ahead and add this performance table. Once again, what would you like to track? Let's enter performance. Now I'll take a look at the results that are returned. And I see there's a performance booking, performers, employee performance reviews. But you know, none of these have anything to do with performance of cars, which is what I'm interested in. So I see this down here. Don't see what you're looking for. Add a new blank table. I'll go ahead and click that. This takes me back to the table designer, but this time it's blank. We've added the ID field there, because every table you create requires that. So we just go ahead and do that for you. Now let's think about what we're doing here. We're tracking the performance of cars, right? So cars is the key point here. We saw this already in car maintenance log, where we were tracking maintenance of cars. We saw in that example we that the table templates created a lookup from car maintenance to cars. So let's repeat what we learned from that table template as we create our own table. I'll add the first field here, car. I'm going to specify this to be a lookup, like I saw before. And this launches the lookup wizard. I want the lookup field to get values from another table or query. And the table I'm interested in is cars. And this time, I'm going to change the display field from year produced to model. And that's all the information that I need to create the lookup. Now let's fill out the rest of the fields in this table. We want this statistic. And once again, I'm going to create this as a lookup. Only this time, because it's just a short, most likely static list, I'm just going to type in the values that I'm interested in. What kind of performance values would you like us to track here? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Cat, cat scratching. <laughs> Horsepower. Perfect. <laughs> well, let's just do HP here. Anything else? Strength? OK. That doesn't make sense. Oh, weight. Yeah, weight of the car. That's pretty important. Any other, anything else there? The time? Yep, 0 to 60 time. <laughs> so I'll just type in a few values there. That's all we need. Finally, we need the value of that statistic. 
So I'll create a new field here, and let's make this one a number. Save the table. I'm going to call it performance. And once again, we go out to the SQL server, and this time tell it, create a new table. Now, similar to last time, when we were just adding a field to the table, remember we modified the existing views? Well, the logical extension of that is, if you're creating a new table, let's create the new views for you. So let's take a look at what Access created for us. I'll close out the designer, and once again, launch the app in my browser. And here's the performance table that we just created. It's got the controls and everything that I need ready to accept data. Now, last thing I want to show you before I hand it back to Steve, remember we made this performance table a lookup to the cars table? Well, when we look at that, Access understands when you're looking at cars, you're going to want to know all the performance data related to that car. So we've actually modified your cars view as well. We've got this related items control here. Notice there's a performance tab now. That wasn't there before. This is going to show me all the record, performance records related to the current record. And I'm going to dive into this a lot deeper when I start showing you the runtime user experience. But for now, I'll hand it back to Steve. Cool. Thanks a bunch, Kevin. So what you just saw was the use of table templates to create a basic application. And I want to drill in on one of the key things that Kevin said. He talked about the users who are using this may not even understand the value of relational schema, they probably wouldn't be able to explain it to you, but they'll know that value when they see it. They'll know when they see an application automatically created for them that allows them to connect these various pieces of data. So now, now that we've talked about the data model, we're going to move on and talk about the user experience. Is it important for an application to have a good user experience? This is a picture of an, app, an access application, um, and it was built about five years ago. And it's a point of sale system in Canada. Is anybody in the room familiar with this? Is the developer here? OK. That's one of my biggest fears about this talk, is not looking forward to that <laughs> confrontation. OK, so the developer here certainly gets points for creativity, but it's hard to argue that this is going to be an easy application for users to use. A good user experience reduces the time to complete tasks. It means that it may, a good user experience. When users use one aspect of the application, they can understand how to use other aspects of the application. It reduces the time for new employees to ramp up because it uses familiar concepts. And it reduces distractions while employees are using the app to get their work done. And again, the point here isn't to poke fun at any particular person or developer. It's just that it takes a lot of time and a lot of expertise to really do great design work. The reality is now in the industry, Great design is, is something that you spend years and years and years developing, getting advanced degrees in graphic design or interaction design. And it's not realistic to expect that the administrative assistants or engineers or folks in your organization who are creating apps are going to have that skill. So what is a good user experience? Well, we think it's consistent so that users can understand how to use applications, parts of the application easily should be fast. You can get in, get your work done, and get out. Content should be given a front row seat. Too often, the application itself swallows the actual content that the user is interested in. And that's certainly the case in the picture that I just showed you. And finally, the app should be intuitive, acting in ways that the user expects. So Kevin's going to come up and show you a little bit more about the user experience that Access Services apps have. So let's take a look at this app again. For the user experience demo, I'm just going to create, go back to the app that I created previously, the one that has a bunch of data in it, just because it's more interesting to look at that way. So we're looking at the, an access application here. This whole piece here is what we call the app home view. And this is how you navigate your application. Down the left side, you have a list of all the tables in the app. Across the top, you have a list of views. The views we list across the top always relate to the currently selected table. So as I change tables, the views change to only show the tables related to that view. As we continue to work on this app, say we add more views, add more queries, develop more insights into our data, you'll see more views stretch across the top here. But you're always only going to be looking at the ones that are currently important to you. 
Now, when you approach an access app, the first question you ask yourself is, which table has the data that I'm interested in? You're not thinking about which button do I click to get at that table. You're thinking about the content first. As soon as you've selected that table, the next question you ask yourself is, how do I want to view that data? And you do that by selecting the different views. Once you've selected the view you're interested in, you can now start looking at the individual records. So we've taken you from the abstract, that is the tables, down to the specific, or the individual records in that table. Now there's a couple important things to notice here. And you're going to get that, this, one of those is that you're going to get this experience across all access apps. This is important. That means when you go to an access app, one, you recognize right away this is an access app. Two, that means you know right away how to use it. So that's kind of the high level navigation of an app. Let me talk a little bit about the individual views that we offer. What we're looking at right now, right here, this is the list, what we call a list details view. The structure of the list details view is that down the left, we give you a list of all the records in the table or query. And on the right side, you get to see the details of that individual record. As I click through the records, you can see the details section updates with the details. Now, that's just high level of how list details work. It's pretty straightforward to explain. But the real power of the list details view comes down to navigation, especially when you have uh, related items uh, in your data. So let's take a look at that. Let's go to the performance table that we just created. And let's start adding new records in performance. So I'm going to start typing in the car here. Now, because car was specified as a lookup to the car's table, we created an autocomplete control. Notice as I typed, it went back to the car's table, and it returns only the records that match what I type. So as I continue typing, that gets filtered down even further until you get down to an exact match. Now, what I've typed so far, I've got down to two records. And I don't know if you've ever raced minivans. Then we'll select a Lamborghini. Statistic, again, this is a lookup, but this time it was just a value list that I typed. So we created a drop-down control. So I'll select horsepower, and I'll enter a value here and save that record. Notice after I saved the record, Countach here got replaced with a hyperlink. Well, if I select that, this is actually going to open a pop-up that shows me all the details for that record. I didn't have to write any code to do this. Access just put this in for me. So there's the relationship from performance to cars. Let's look at the other side. Let's look at cars. Now, this is what I left you with at the end of my last demo, right? We were looking at the performance tab of the related items control. This whole thing is the related items control, and there's two tabs on it. Now, when you look at the related items control, right away I can tell that cars, the currently selected table, has two tables that look up to it, maintenance log and performance. Now, it says here that there's no related items. That makes sense. We didn't see any uh, data and performance table for this car, the Cadillac test that I modified in SQL Server. But we did add performance data for the Lamborghini Countach. So let's find that. I've selected the filter control here. And you get this control for free on every list details view that you create. Again, no code required for that. I'm going to type in the record that I'm interested in and hit Enter to search for it. And it comes right back with the Lamborghini Countach. Not only that, in the related items control, here's the data that we just entered, 450 horsepower. And we can take it further still. Say we want to add more records to the performance table for this car. I just need to click Add Performance. And I get a pop-up. Looks very similar to what we were just working with in the performance list details view, so that we can add more performance data for the Lamborghini Countach. Notice also, because we launched it from that record, cars automatically populated with that value. So I just need to specify a statistic. This time, I'll do 0 to 60 time. And I'll specify my value as 4.5 seconds. Save that. Close that. And my related items control updates with that new data. Now, let's take a step back and think about what just happened here. We noticed by looking at existing access applications out there, about 80% of the code that people write is just to handle navigation. So what does that mean? That means you're writing an app. 
you spend 80% of your coding time writing navigation code. I'm writing an app. I spend 80% of my time writing, writing navigation code. We're both trying to solve the same problem, but we're both wasting our time on it, and we're going to end up with different solutions. I don't think that's a good use of time. We should be spending that time customizing our app to meet our specific business needs, not writing navigation code. Access is going to take care of all that for you in this release. So that was the list details view. There's two other view types that I want to show you. The first of these is a data sheet view. Data sheet view is fairly straightforward. It's just a spreadsheet style view of your data. If I can get it to load here. Maybe if I switch to a different one. Okay, well, I'll let that sit while I explain what data sheet view does. So a data sheet view is just a spreadsheet style list of your data. So it's just a typical grid like you'd see you know, in Excel or something. And it gives you some uh, basic navigation options like doing ad hoc sorting, ad hoc filtering. Uh, data sheet is really useful for bulk data operations. Uh, you can do a bulk copy and paste. So if you wanted to select a whole bunch of records, copy those, paste those further on. Or also, if you want to copy from an Excel spreadsheet, you can do that and then paste into the data sheet view. Uh, it's also useful if you just want to. Uh, yeah, the, the data sheet view is having problems. Yeah. If I don't think no. so. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, this never happened as we were practicing this. And I apologize, but it's, uh, yeah. it's it, the data sheet is not an ActiveX control. It's just HTML right. and JavaScript, and I've never seen it fail before. So uh, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, but of all the views to fail, I'd say that the data sheet is the best yeah. of them because it's the one that you've all seen yeah. many times in your life. It's just it looks just like Excel. So maybe it'll maybe it'll load as I'm talking, maybe not, but it's something you've seen before, like Steve mentioned. The final view that I want to talk about, and one that's gonna work, is called the summary view. Now what a summary view does is it takes all the records from a table or a query and it groups those records according to the field that you specify. So if we think about the cars table here, we have a list of a whole bunch of different car types. Say we want to group those cars according to make. Now this view doesn't exist in my app yet, so I'm going to go ahead and create it. To do that, I'll select the settings in the corner here and customize an access. This allows me to open up the access app that I'm looking at in the rich access client to make design modifications. So it's going to download all the objects from the server and open it up in the client. This is going to take a quick second here. So here's the app in the designer. So as I said, we want a summary view based on cars. So I'll select cars, and we want to add a new view. So let's take a look at the view selector. We have the same app home view style in the designer versus the runtime. It looks very similar. I'll click this add new view button, give my view a name. So we're going to do cars by make and we need to select a view type. We've already seen list details. We tried to look at data sheet. Let's make a summary. And I'll click Add New View, and this view is created for me. That's all I need to do to create the view. Now there's one tweak that I need to make, so let's open up this view in the designer. If we look at this in the designer, let's take a look at the grouping panel here. This says that we're gonna group the summary view based on the year produced. Well, I already said we actually want to group based on the make. This is really easy to change. I'll just select the data charm here, and then I'll change the group by property from your produced to make. And that's all that I need to do to get my summary view. Save those changes, and I'll open this up in the browser. And here you can see the view that we just created. I'll select that, and here's what we got. So this is the summary view. On the left side of the screen, you can see a list of all the distinct makes. Next to each value, there's a number indicating the count of records in that group. That can also be an average or a sum if you'd like. And actually for the group, it doesn't just need to be a field. If you want to group by an expression, that's allowed too. So say you want to group by the first letter of the car, or if you want to group by decade that the car was produced, you can do that. Now notice as I select, the details section of my summary view updates to show only the records with the make of Cadillac or Ferrari or here's what we've been playing with, 
Lamborghini. And we can do even more with the summary view. Here's the Lamborghini Countach we've been working with so far. If I click that, it opens up a pop-up. Again, shows me all the details of that car. And just like I showed you before, I can switch to the performance tab. Now get the performance details. And I'll go even further still. I can add more performance records right through this pop-up. Now you guys watched me all create this. It took about 30 seconds of my time. And in those 30 seconds, I developed new insights into my data with my group views. Not only that, I got a premium navigation experience without writing a single line of code. That's a pretty powerful tool to have in your hands to create insights into your data. So there's the runtime portion, and with that, I'll hand it back to Steve. Yeah. That's you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks a bunch, Kevin. So what you just saw was a great user experience created automatically. And I know a lot of the folks in this room, if you worked hard, you could create that experience or even a better experience in .NET, but it's something that you'd have to work hard at. You wouldn't be able to do it right here in front of everybody. So we think we've made it really easy to get that 90% of the application built out of the box. And then we have extensibility mechanisms for you to do the rest. The experience is consistent, it's fast, and it's intuitive. If all this looks a little bit familiar, it's because just like a lot of folks in Microsoft, we've been influenced by the Windows and the Windows Phone team, and we think they've created a user experience model that we can follow to make great apps. One of the things I don't bring up here as a value, but it's worth mentioning, is robustness. Uh, it's actually a tricky engineering challenge to make sure that these apps work across all modern browsers, and it's one, it's one that we do. So let me quickly talk about access services within the larger context of the apps that you're hearing about this week. You're hearing about apps for Office. These are ways to extend Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook. And you're hearing about apps for SharePoint as well. So access services apps are apps for SharePoint. And really, you can think of access as a tool for building these apps for SharePoint. If you're a professional developer, you're going to be happiest using Visual Studio. It's a familiar co coding environment. It's incredibly powerful. And you can use it to create apps for Office or apps for SharePoint. You'll probably hear about Napa this week. It's a super cool in-browser tool. But just like Visual Studio, it's really designed for the person who's comfortable with code. If you're a non-professional developer who wants to do things by a more drag and drop method, then Access is the way to go. And you can use it to build apps for SharePoint. Uh, during this presentation, we focused on the experience of building an app for your team from scratch. And we've made that really easy. I want you to know it's also possible to start from somebody else's work. You can go to the SharePoint store and download an app there. And many of the apps in the SharePoint store were powered by Access. So here's what the store looks like um, right now, just a screenshot of it. And two of the apps on this page here, the Business Contact Manager uh, and the Asset Tracking app, those were built in Access. Uh, on total right now, I think there are about seven or eight apps in the store that were built in Access. There's also an app catalog for those of you in large organizations who want to roll out apps to your organization. And again, access services apps can fit there. This is just a picture of the, of the experience that you can use to actually save out a package. Um, and one of the things to note here is that you can go into access, create an app, save it out as a package, and that gives you a .app file. And a .app file can be submitted up to the store. So this is a great way to, 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 to take your knowledge and immediately capitalize it and put stuff into the store. Indeed, this is one of the, the easiest and quickest ways to get content up into the store. So, just to conclude, users in your organization will build apps with access. And they're going to be great apps. And they're going to be great apps because they're in a managed, safe environment, and because they have a great data model and a great user experience. Thanks very much for your time. Now, how much time, how about are you doing on time? Can somebody tell me what time it is? Yep. OK, perfect. So we've got till 11th. Oh, we've got plenty of time. Yep. Great. Perfect. Well, then, uh, let's see, a couple of quick things. So uh, these are cards. How many, of you, how many of you have gotten these cards already? Anybody? All right. So I'm going to actually, could I have some of the members of the Access team here? Oh, you're here, actually. Great. Perfect. So, <laughs> Sorry to get sick of great. So that's OK. 
Um, so these are cards that you can fill out if you're intending to build an, access, an application, whether it be an access or another tool. Um, fill them out and, so, and uh, bring them to the, I think it's to the developer kiosk in the... Yes, in the pavilion. Um, the prize, I understand it for this, is that you can actually have the potential to win a evening with a Microsoft program manager. who will tell you how to build your app and help you build it. Um, so that's a really cool opportunity that's happening right now. Um, uh, I also want to quickly introduce you to the other topics that we're discussing today. So this was the introductory talk to Access Services. Uh, we've got four more talks over the course of the, con the uh, conference. There's a talk called Configuring and Managing Access Services in SharePoint 2013. Um, that's for those of you who don't use the cloud and instead use your on-prem server. So that'll tell you how to set up Access Services in your on-prem environment. There's a talk called Taming the Beast. And uh, Taming the Beast is all about organizations that are frustrated with the access databases in, your, in their organization right now that are difficult to manage. We hear about that a lot. And we have a solution for taking those databases and moving them up to access services. We've got a deeper dive, which just takes off where this talk left off and goes into the technology more deeply. And we've got a talk on moving legacy Lotus Notes applications into access services. Um, finally, there's a hands-on lab if you want to uh, check that out as well. Um, and with that in place, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have. Okay, we'll start at the front here. Yeah, so um, a couple pivots on that question and see what, uh, if I understand what you're getting correctly. So one option would be if you created another table to store the lookups, and then that would let your users go ahead and enter wanna, the yeah, values that you so, want. Yeah, one sec, we need to repeat the question just because folks didn't hear it. So the question was about uh, the usability of adding a bunch of records using a lookup. Yeah, basically on that exact example, the performance model, yep. how you had to go in and add statistics one at a time. Yep. Right. Uh, if, it's a look, if it's a value list, you need to do that from the table designer. If it's a lookup to another table, like I did with the cars, for example, then your users have the ability to actually see that list and, and type in new values if they want. The, the McKinstry tool tracking app that we talked about, they had a similar complaint in that you had to ch initially you had to check in and check out tools on a one-off basis. And uh, we, we made a modification of the database so that you could do bulk check-in. Um, that's not a scenario that like, you just like, create the scheme and it automatically works, but it's one that's absolutely supported in the model. OK, great. We've got a lot of questions. So we're just going to go bang back and forth uh, between the microphones. If folks can go to the microphone, that would be helpful just so we can hear. Um, OK, we'll start here. I I understand what you're doing about making a very simple interface that everyone goes to an app, sees it. Yeah. But how much power do I have to make it into a more interesting or slightly better form? Not quite your terrible example, but something a bit more. And my second follow-up question is, what kind of reporting can we do? Sometimes I need to print out or great. take yeah. Sure. Yeah, great questions. Um, and since you are in the mic, I won't repeat them. So the first question, how much power do you have? Well, what we showed today was really the, the basic experience. The more advanced experience we're going to cover in the, in the deeper dive, we have UI macros that you can author and access services. And those are translated and run as JavaScript. And we have data macros that you author and access services. And those are run as uh, T-SQL, uh, stored procedures and triggers. Now, it's not, I don't wanna, it's not a full coding, coding environment. Um, it's not a full code editor, but it, is, it gives you the ability to add functionality like the tool tracking app that I just talked about. Second question was about reporting. So the reporting story that we have right now is it's just a SQL database. You can connect to it via ODBC, and we think it's great if you want to connect to it via Access to do printed out reports or via Excel to do charts and graphs. Um, so those are, the, those are the stories that we have for reporting for this release. 
Oh, SharePoint themes. Great. Another question. Like, we hear this a lot. Folks just want to make their database look pretty, um, uh, look nicer than sort of the default blue that's out of the box. So we, we use SharePoint themes. And if you uh, adjust your SharePoint theme, you'll get the colors associated with that theme. Over here. OK, so a couple of questions. Uh, first, around SharePoint workflow. Mm -hmm. In the 2010 timeframe, we weren't supporting workflow against Access apps. Has that changed? And then also the uh, upgrade story from, hey, I have a user who created a SharePoint list and started doing apps. Can, uh, how easy is it, to, is it to move to Access? Yep. And then uh, from the further side, if I get to sure. business critical, can I do an MVC against that SQL? OK, three questions in one. Gosh, now I forgot. Two, so <laughs> OK. Count that together. Excellent. OK, so your first question is about workflow. Yeah. OK, so folks who were, who were used Access Services 2010 know that it was based on SharePoint lists. Workflow works with SharePoint lists, so it worked with 2010. It's, um, when we moved the architecture over to, to SQL, one of the things we lost was, was workflow. So it's, you can't easily build custom workflow against, um, against Access Services apps. Okay. Um, and so we basically took ourselves from being on the SharePoint list continuum to being instead on the SQL continuum. And there's some, we think the benefits dramatically outweigh the costs, but there are some costs. OK, second question. I'm so sorry, I forget, was, what, I forget what it was. So if I have a SharePoint list, oh, I upgrading, want to upgrade yes. it. Yeah, actually, a lot of folks have done this. Um, it, the reality is SharePoint lists, one of the, look, I don't want to bemoan SharePoint lists. They have their space. But one of the problems is they're fairly constricted in terms of the schema that you can do. So we had a lot of trouble in the past with taking data that was initially authored for SQL and moving into SharePoint. But the reverse is actually works pretty well most of the time. And folks actually often use Access to do that migration because Access can read from SharePoint lists and push that data into SQL. So there's not a one-button solution to that, but absolutely people can do it, can make that migration happen. And also, by the way, the other thing that you can do is if you don't want to move the data out of SharePoint lists, if you want to keep it in SharePoint lists, you can use SharePoint lists as an external data source for your Access Services app um, and connect and read that data from SharePoint. Okay. And then the MVC against uh, the SQL database that you guys created in the back? It's just, a, so I'm gonna, uh, it's just a SQL database, and you can have ODBC, you have an ODBC connection to it. So you can do anything that you can with that. Okay. I've haven't, I don't have particular experience. Do you have a? No. I just wanted to make sure it was supported. Like. Anything that you can do, uh, you can read and write the data with ODBC. So anything yeah, you can I do with that. Yeah, I imagine you could. Brilliant. Yeah, and if you, in, in a couple of the other demos this week, we're gonna show you that in depth. All right, let's come back to this microphone. Okay, we have a heavy investment in InfoPath. Uh -huh. And then we end up taking using workflows to pull the XML and stick it into SQL. So this sounds like a perfect way to maybe make it simpler. Yep. So what is the delta between an, an InfoBath rich client experience with the repeating tables, include URLs, buttons, and the access development environment? Kevin's going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's a tough question. I'm not, I'm not a super expert on InfoPath. Um, and so I, I think there, it's hard to, I don't have the bulleted list where I can just say here, here, here. I think if you want to come up afterwards and we, we can talk about it, about um, what your solutions use, I can probably find ways. I will say there's no automatic migration story. So there's no one button, just take your InfoPath solution and move it into Access Services. Um, but we definitely see ourselves, you know, uh, working in that scenario quite a bit. And, but please do come up afterwards because I do want to, I'm, I'm happy to work with you on that. Okay, over here. Um, sort of similar to when you get to that point where you outgrow the Access app. Uh, what are your options for getting that to Visual Studio and converting the, the interface and the, the back-end code? To, obviously, the database is pretty straightforward, but what about the other stuff? The database is pretty straightforward. Um, it's, it, it is just a, every table in Access is a yep. table in SQL. Every, view, every query that you write in Access is a view in SQL. Every data map you write is a stored procedure. But um, we have, and, and you can save it out as a, as a dot .app file. And if you open up that dot .app file, you'll discover that inside it is a DAC pack. I don't know if you're familiar with DAC packs, but that's the storage format for SQL. But the interface, it's not easy to move for this release. It's a direction we're looking at in the future. Okay. But the data and the, and, the, and the sort of the SQL aspects of it is, is relatively straightforward. OK. Thank okay. you. Security. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the last version, it was through SharePoint. How is uh, security handled in this version? I actually have a slide on this, so let me just, let me just quickly. I thought I might get this as a question. Uh, uh, come on, I think I've, here we go. Okay. So um, if you're, it, it's based on SharePoint security. If, you're, uh, if you have read access, you can read the data. If you have write access, you can write the data. If you are, uh, have full control, you can modify the database. So is it the full, the full range of... Um, SharePoint security is 
uh, SharePoint permission levels, I should say. Just those three are the ones that matter. Reading the data, we don't really support anything more granular than that. And you can't do table level permissions if that's you know, what you're looking at. Uh, you can't do table, uh, yeah. Okay. It's just read access to the site. Um, you can establish an ODBC connection, and if you do, that's just a SQL auth. Anybody who has the username and password to that can read or write the data. Okay. There's actually a read-only connection and a read-write connection with a different password. All right, thank so you. So that's the security story. Yeah, over here. Okay, you might already answer this question. Just uh, we have some access uh, database which use ODBC and uh, access Oracle database. So, uh, and we have some calling and write some store procedures and really uh, query and update the Oracle database. Do you guys have any uh, experience about that and how it's supported on the 2013? You got a good, uh, good answer to this? So for 2013 databases, everything exists on SQL Server. We still, still support the full legacy client if you wanted to continue those scenarios going forward. But right now it's just the SQL Server tables that you get from the app creation story that I showed you. Okay, so if I have some code already embedded in the access database. Right, VBA. Can update and, uh, you know, the uh, Oracle database as an ODBC linked table. And will that be suppo uh, still supported when we upgrade? Oh, sure. Yeah, the, 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 it's still supported going, every, uh, to be super clear here, any database you've written and access in the past yeah. will continue to work in 2013. There's okay. no, but it's not going to automatic, your, the, this scenario you've built of an access desktop database with an Oracle backend, right. there's no easy story for getting that into access services with a web front end. But, you know, this is, it's not impossible. It's something we need to work through the details out. Okay, thanks. Sure. It's kind of related to that. If you create one of these databases and then go into SQL Server and like add a view that maybe references another database or a link server, is that exposed? Do you see it in Access? Can you build forms on it and stuff? You're you're not going to see it in the in Access 2013 in the new version. Uh, you can create again a legacy Access database and connect to that data and have both the tables from your new Access app in 2013 and also link to tables in whatever existing solutions that you have and pull them together in the legacy client. Oh, okay. You just can't see them in SharePoint. Or... Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, on your uh, demo video there was an example of like using a barcode scanner to like get information into the system. I was curious how that type of integration would work. We love work, that uh... barcode scanner. Man, <laughs> yeah. it just, every, I wish we actually had it here to demo because it's just awesome and everybody loves it. But I'll tell you a secret, it's just a USB input device. It works just like a keyboard. Okay. So, it's, so it just, it just, it just, it's great, and it's, and the, the McKinstry loves the thing, uh, but I will, won't lie to you and say it was super difficult to get it working. Okay, well, good information. No, you guys should have a booth in the expo floor. I mean, you probably would make a lot of the third-party providers down there cry, but, yeah. Why, why is that? Oh, okay. Quite honestly, you solve a lot of problems with this, so. Oh, thank yeah. you. We appreciate that. So it seems like with 2013, there are like 17 ways to build apps. And as we think about which product to use, um, I, I start thinking about SharePoint search and what, what, you know, that data that you're putting in, all your users are putting in, how well is it is access services integrated with SharePoint search and getting that, all that information back to them in 16 different ways? It's a great question. And, um, I think one of the things you're seeing here is uh, I, I'd, I'd sort of, I'm going to push this up a little bit to the larger sort of app model store question where uh, you saw in the keynote yesterday, there's a lot of talk right now about sort of building uh, solutions that run in Windows Azure um, and places like that. And it is true when you, when you store data in SQL, it's not indexed by search. I'm looking around to, at somebody who can, I don't, yeah, I think that's correct. Um, and so there is a, there's a discontinuity there and you have some, you have some choices. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't have a particularly great answer for this right now. So one of the things, when, when I saw in your table, you said add a table, and one of them could have been a SharePoint list. That's so right. is it maybe the, at least an entry point to get to the data if at least one of your tables is stored as a SharePoint list, and then that's indexed? That's true. And then it can be your gateway into the rest of the... Yes, you can, you can link to a share, another SharePoint list, and that data would be indexed by search. Use, okay, so the question there is, can you use BCS to create a link to a SharePoint list and then to the external data, surface that as a SharePoint list and link to it? Lois, no, you can't. I apologize. Yeah. 
right over here. Uh, I had a question about search too. So uh, this is not integrated within the SharePoint search. Um, and then um, are there, is there any other connectivity with SharePoint? So if you have existing SharePoint lists and, and uh, libraries, can you use them in your access application? And uh, also, for instance, manage metadata, data. can it also be used? Or is, it, or, or is this just a standalone, or a, a web version of your standalone database that you have without any other connectivity to SharePoint or existing SharePoint content? So the, the SharePoint connectivity that we have today is you can link to existing SharePoint lists and read the data from that. You can do that. You can read the data from your SharePoint lists in an Access app. Okay. And we know that that's a start, and we're looking at, at, more, at, at much more work that we can do that area. And, and can you use things like manage metadata? Um, no. Kevin says that, we, that you can't, so I okay. think that you can't. It's for the next version then. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Or the next release within nine months or so. <laughs> so when you deployed it into um, SharePoint, it yes. looked like you kind of deployed it as like its own uh, site collection. Is, does it have to be its own site collection or can it be a web within an existing site collection? It was an app deployed within a site. Okay. Well, it, like if you want to just spin off a new site collection, will it create that as well? Like, or it has to, you have to point to an existing site collection. Like what are the options? It, no, it will not create. So in that scenario, you would have to create the site collection yourself ahead of time, and then you can deploy the app on that site collection. And you can put it anywhere in the site collection. Right. right. Sorry, I had one more. Um, if uh, you, now that Access is moving into the service side via SharePoint, are there any uh, plans to get the, uh, the UI on things like you know, Windows Phone or any other, uh, any other recipients uh, of like SharePoint? Yeah, we don't have anything to announce today, but, uh, but yeah, that's clearly an area that we need to pursue. We, we, you know, I talked to, or in my sort of opening statement, I said that folks want to be able to access it on any device that they care about, and that's clearly an area we need to look into. Yeah, and we're set up well. It's just HTML and JavaScript. I've got a question about uh, custom fields in SharePoint. Okay. How do you handle custom fields and reading those uh, in the list? Um, I think that we just, we connect to SharePoint lists, but I don't think we handle custom fields. This is, a, this is more like a content type question. I'm looking over at Kevin, our resident at SharePoint. We don't handle, cu handle custom fields, field types? Okay, so we don't handle them. So, so how will they be handled? They're just not rendered or? I don't, I don't know the details here. Yeah, I think we just wouldn't bring them. Okay. We just wouldn't see them. Yeah. Right. Yes, the question was about custom field types in SharePoint, and I think we, we only support the default uh, field types in SharePoint that can be easily mapped to SQL types. I wanted to mention, I talked to the fast guys about search, mm. and they're saying you could configure the ODBC source as something you could crawl as part mm. of your SharePoint site. Oh, so cool. So then it's just crawlable as any other source, but you have to configure and say, these are the ones I want to crawl, but if you have data, that needs to be done, so you can do that. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. That's a great point. That's a great point. Any other questions? We can take some from the audience without the mics if anybody wants to. Oh my gosh! <laughs> we had to have t-shirts this whole time. Yes, we have like a million t-shirts back here. If you want a t-shirt, uh, we'd love to give you one. Thanks. I was going to throw them. Yeah, I know. But then you get to see how I throw, which is not pretty. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. I really, we'll be up here for a little bit more. <laughs>